Welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast, produced in partnership with the A.B. Corker Foundation for Mental Health. We are your co-hosts, Bridget and Terry. Each week, through intimate, candid conversations with guests, we explore different perspectives on and experiences of depression. We keep it real because the illness is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We are not experts or therapists. We are sisters and best friends who live with depression and have interviewed hundreds of other people who do as well. We've learned that hearing others speak openly and without shame about their experiences makes it easier to believe depression is a common and treatable illness, not a personal failing. You are far from alone. Hello, Bridget. Hi, Terry. Welcome to season 19. Wow. One of the very most powerful takeaways of being able to talk to people about their depression and mental health journeys is that every single person has something to teach us. Our guests have taught us new language for describing and understanding what it's really like to be in depression's grip. We've learned new strategies and tools to help us stay a step ahead of the slide or to climb out of the pit in less time and with less damage, which is always the goal. Mm -hmm. Guests have shared about better ways to prepare for a possible mental health crisis by pre-planning and lining up resources before they're needed. And guests regularly remind us of the absolute fact that there is nothing weak or even especially unusual about having a mental health challenge. I'm going to repeat that because I think that is the absolute opposite of what our brains tell us. Oh, I agree. The absolute fact that there is nothing weak or even especially unusual about having a mental health challenge. Not at all. <sighs> yeah, mind blown. Not, not at all. And we've learned that when we go into an interview with the intention of exploring A, B, and C, we can limit our potential lessons. Conversely, when we loosen the reins and let the conversation take us places more organically, we explore nooks we never would have thought to ask about. Today's episode is a great example of that. We reached out to today's guest, Lacey, because we loved the idea that as a teen, she saw a therapist for her depression and anxiety. And then, in her 20s, she was helping teens as a social worker. And that circle of life is part of this episode. But that's just what Lacey did, not what she learned, which is a lot. So we've decided to give this conversation the space of two episodes to unfold. We caught Lacey on a sabbatical outside in the sun in Costa Rica. So you'll hear a little life in the background. Here is Lacey giving her voice to depression. Okay, Lacey, first of all, thank you for taking a break on your break to talk to us. And if you don't mind, I'd love to start with you telling us about your 14-year-old self. Oh, yes. Oh, 14-year-old Lacey, man, she was... She was so full of spirit and also very scared um, because um, I was really lost when I started feeling the symptoms of depression and anxiety. And in fact, I didn't even know what they were really when they were happening to me because mental health was just not talked about in my home. Um, It wasn't that it was shamed, but it was more of just that my parents didn't have the tools to talk about those kinds of things. And Lacey describes her childhood as stable and secure with none of the so-called big T traumas. So when she started experiencing symptoms of mental health disorders, her mother and her friends were really confused. So before 14, I was very energetic. I was very outgoing. I was an extrovert. And then those symptoms hit and I was a completely different person. I turned into an introvert. I stayed in my room um, all day, every day, just leaving to go to school. Um, And my friends were very confused because they loved me for my extroverted self. And I was getting questions from my friends like, why Why are you acting so strange? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? They couldn't understand either. To try to gain some understanding, Lacey sought professional help. So what symptoms or situations brought you to a therapist's office at that time? Um, I would say it was the uncontrollable crying about everything. I was 
always a highly sensitive person. I still am. And I'm very proud of my highly sensitive person label. Um, but you know, back then it wasn't, it wasn't just that I was sensitive. It was that I was crying about things that were happy. I was crying about things that were anger inducing. I was crying when nothing was happening. Um, and so that was the most concerning thing to me. To Lacey, but others saw it differently. My mom would tell you that the most concerning symptoms were that I stopped eating. Um, I would say I was also diagnosed with bulimia at that time. It was just another symptom of the depression that I was going through. Um, so my mom would tell you that my symptoms look like me not eating, me having no expression on my face, me pulling away from everyone in my life. Um, and because I didn't have anything that really like in my environment that was triggering this, it was none of it made sense. My moods never made sense. If the sound of someone nodding their head while listening to a podcast was audible, we suspect we'd hear a lot of it right now. Because people with depression know our moods often don't make sense. That's one of the things that makes them so hard to explain and experience. And so I had never, I had known no one in my life at that point that had actually gone into therapy. So it was a very, very terrifying experience for me. Um, and no adult had ever asked me how I was or asked me to describe my depression. Before that, it was that everyone was avoiding asking me that. So it was a very opposite experience to what I was experiencing before going into therapy. It was very life changing for me. Life changing, she says. To have someone listen, understand, and validate what's going on in your mind and body. Oh, very much so. And I think it was, I mean, my first therapist was the first person to tell me that your physical health is in your mental health are just as important as each other. Um, and I'd never heard that before. Uh, I I'd, I'd never he even heard uh, that mental health was important in period, <laughs> let alone as important as physical health. Lacey was lucky that her first therapist was a good one who was able to connect a lot of dots for her. It's not just you being a 14 year old because that's what I was told up to that point. You know, I was just, this is, you're just feeling this way because you're, ang you're an angsty teen um, and all teens feel this way, right? And so when I went to the therapist's office and she was like, what you're describing to me is not a normal teenage experience. You deserve to be happy. And it, that was just something I had never heard before. I thought that, you know, I, everyone else was going through it too, just were better at hiding it than me, I guess. Um, but, you know, she really reassured me that everything I was experiencing, should I should not have to tolerate. Um, so that was the first time I had learned that, which was really, really important um, to, the rest, to the rest of my experience on, in mental health, really. She set a really good foundation for me. From that foundation, Lacey started learning which tools worked for her. Uh, first and foremost, would say that when I entered into therapy, it wasn't just with a psychotherapist, it was with a psychiatrist as well. Um, and they were in the same practice and worked with the same clients. So it was kind of, you know, they were um, tag teaming this, the, all their clients, which was wonderful. Lacey believes her depression is largely due to a chemical imbalance, as evidenced by the fact antidepressants work well for her. Still, she had the common and frustrating experience of having to experiment to find the right meds to manage her conditions. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it all went away. Um, I, I also had my own struggles with finding which antidepressant worked. I would say it took four or five years of on and off different medications until I found something that worked for me. Um, but that was, that was one of the main things was she, she heard my story and was like, you're right. It doesn't make sense that you would feel this way because it sounds like you do have a pretty, pretty happy and content life. Um, and so once I was put on antidepressants at that age, it was discovering the balance of what it means to live holy and emotions, right? Um, I think one of the, the major things in that journey for me was recognizing that it's not about completely getting rid of the sadness and it's not about com completely being happy all the time. Um, it, you know, really s holding space for each of those things and not allowing the people in my life to make me feel as though that those feelings shouldn't exist. 
self-acceptance versus self-judgment. But up until that point, I felt like that was that was something wrong with me. And then through that therapy experience, I learned like that's just a part of who I am and I need to hold space for all that. And so it was it, that above everything was one of the most important lessons I learned into getting where I was. Lacey pauses here to share that just as with finding the right medications to manage our mental health, finding the right therapist might also take some patience and effort. This is what I tell people literally all the time because people will go into therapy one time, have a therapist that they don't connect with, and then be like, well, therapy is not for me. Um, And I have to say, you know, you're not going to like every single person you meet. It's the same thing with therapy. Um, it's it's a relationship. And if you don't trust that person, if you don't feel a connection with that person, then no, it's not going to go anywhere. And sometimes you have to shop around to find the person that's going to work best for you. Um, and throughout my life, I've known that to be true. I've gone in and out of therapy with therapists that I've loved, therapists that I have not loved so much, and even therapists where I've gone out and been like, wow, I I'm really concerned that that person is helping people for a living because I, you know, would come in out of those experiences feeling nothing but more shame. And of course, therapists aren't the only people that we can have paradigm shifting conversations with. Lacey discovered a huge piece that had been missing from her personal puzzle when after breaking the ice in therapy, she decided to share with her paternal grandmother. She ended up telling me that she had struggled all of her life with depression and that her mom had struggled her whole life with depression and that my dad had gone through periods of depression that I had never known about. Um, and it took away this big, this the big blanket of shame that I felt within my family. Um, it just like lifted and was like this big epiphany moment of like, wow, the people that I, the person that I love most, my Oma, what also struggled with the same thing. And she was still still very happy in her life and was able to live a very full life because at that time, like my depression was so pervasive and deep that I didn't know if I was going to make it past 16, honestly. I was, you know, it wasn't just depression. It was suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts. I, I never created a plan, um, but I was self-harming. And so I I just at that age could not have pictured my life long term like that. And so when I heard the woman that I admired most say that she has gone up and down with it her whole life, I suddenly felt hope for the first time that it, like if she could do it, I could do it because she didn't have the resources that I did. And I had more than she had. And if you know she could do it with what little resources she had, then I could do it. Um, so that was the beginning of, of hope for me, I believe. The beginning of hope, learning that it's not your fault you have depression and that others with it are leading full and good lives, even people in our own circles or families who we admire and trust, something we learn only by speaking openly and shamelessly, as Lacey now does as a social worker. From working the jobs that I've worked, I have discovered that vulnerability is the most most precious thing that humans have and is the easiest and best way to connect with others and that it's very it's very little of time that i've (laughs) that it's been a negative thing for me you know the the good with vulnerability has vastly outweighed the negative um so i I just can't imagine ever going back to a place where i wouldn't want to share those jobs have included working as a substance abuse counselor providing on-site services for people with severe mental illness and now as a social worker for people who are homeless And we wondered what Lacey has learned about the sometimes fine line between being mentally healthy and mentally unwell. I just wonder what what you know, because you've been both places, as opposed to somebody who's only been a therapist or somebody who's only been a patient. That's a fascinating question. Um, (laughs) That's a really good question, what the line is there. It's it's so funny because I I would say that every single person at some point in their life suffers with some sort of mental illness, just like every single person suffers from some sort of physical illness at some point in their lives. Um, And so, you know, the line there is just such a blurry one. You know, looking at as illness, I see somebody who's ill as somebody who's not receiving support. 
who's not addressing the things that are popping up in their lives that are sending them into chaos. Um, because that can be that can be such a plethora of things on the spectrum of mental illness. You can suffer through a week of extreme anxiety and be ill during that period of time and then come back out of it the next week. But I feel like putting sometimes the label of mental illness can scare people away from getting that support because they they don't feel like they want to be labeled with a disorder. And Lacey says that has prevented a lot of her professional co-workers from seeing the bigger picture. Um, when you're so focused on labeling somebody with a disorder that you're not seeing their symptomology, symptomology for what it is, which is just like a normal human reaction to inhuman circumstances that are going on in their lives. Um, a lot of the times that mental health, mental illness thing, because everyone has a mental health and therefore I think everyone has mental illness at some point. I think they're one and the same, I guess, is what I'm saying. Boy, this makes me just want to do a little shout out here for all the helpful, present therapists and social workers that are out there, because I agree with Lacey, you have to shop around to find a fit for you, and they are definitely not all a fit. Mm -hmm. But to teach somebody to hold space for all their different aspects, you know, within themselves that so often seem contradictory to one another is really good work. I think it's a really good reminder, too, that we you know, all of mental health, all of physical health is on a spectrum. And we do have to allow, you know, we can't expect to be happy all the time because nobody is, not even people who don't have depression. And yeah, I just thought it was a really good reminder. And I love the way she put it. There you are again, saying something that's like, that's so radical to say out loud that like nobody is happy all the time. <laughs> True though, it's right? It's just like you think of that as the default baseline of, you know, wh- where we should all be at. And it's just a crock. Yep. It's a crock. It is. It's not, it's not a reality. For the most positive of people. Yeah. Well, we're going to continue this conversation with Lacey next week, and we'll talk about the non-linear nature of recovery, the importance of finding people with lived experience to be on your team so they really get it, Mm -hmm. and the importance of hearing versus fixing someone in need. Excellent. Thanks, Lacey. Thank you, Lacey. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression, or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. It is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on depression's dark road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.